Very good afternoon to everyone. I hope you are doing well and safe at home or in your office. Welcome to the Earth Day 2023 panel discussion. Thank you for uh, taking time to join us uh, in this important discussion before we take a long Hari Raya weekend. My name is Vic Naya. I'm the president of District College Penang in Malaysia. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to moderate the discussion today. Let me first uh, start with a few uh, housekeeping announcements. Please, being recorded and will be made available to all those who have registered uh, participants uh, for this uh, presentation today. All your microphone uh, has been muted. Uh, this is to avoid any disturbance during the presentation. All discussions will be done after all the panelists have presented their views. If you have any question for the panel, uh, please put them in the chat box directing uh, to the said panelists. Or you can raise your hands uh, for us to unmute you for your questions or your views. Before we begin our discussion today, uh, let me first uh, present to you the Earth Day 2023 video uh, provided to us courtesy of the International uh, Earth Day Organization. So before we go into our discussion, let me do a quick intro about District College for those participants who are not from District. District College is uh, one of uh, one of the first Penang-based uh, private tertiary institution, which was set up in 1987. The college uh, have graduated more than 15,000 students in various uh, pre-university diploma and degree program, as you can see uh, on, on the screen here. Currently, uh, District is going through a new management restructuring that will allow us to offer uh, new degree programs, uh, as you can see here, right from diploma and also the bachelor's degree program. So please do check us out in our website for further details. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as the world continue uh, its global fight against COVID-19, even up to today, we have not forgotten Earth Day and the significance of this event. Earth Day is an annual event held on April 22nd to demonstrate support for environmental protection. Although we are celebrating today on the 20th, just to make way for Hari Raya that falls on the 22nd. It, is, it was first held on April 22nd in 1970. It now uh, includes... Uh, a wide range of events coordinated globally by Earth Day organization, formerly known as uh, Earth Day Network. So Earth Day movement is uh, supported uh, more than 1 billion people in more than 193 countries, including uh, Malaysia. This year, similar theme as uh, 2022 has been adopted by the International Earth Day Organization. The theme for Earth Day 2023, Invest in Our Planet, uh, is a call to action uh, for all of us, from individuals to governments to industry, to innovate and collaborate for a healthy and prosperous planet. We can identify countless examples of how the Earth uh, naturally sustains life. Uh, over time, we have also learned how to harness the Earth's uh, resources to sustain a growing population and advance technological progress. Post-COVID-19, uh, innovations are needed to ensure we sustainably have healthy food, um, readily available energy sources, and clean water. So what can we do to invest in our planet? 
there are many things that can that we can do individually, coordinated group, from reducing plastic pollution, conserving water and energy, building resilient communities, and also to protect terrestrial and uh, and marine ecosystem. The issue of uh, climate change cannot be forgotten as Malaysia continue to be impacted by flash flood and haze that as you can see now, because of mother nature or even the act of God, but not just the act of God, but also because of poor management and, and disregard for the environment in all our planning and development. So the issue of uh, gender inequality uh, as highlighted in UN SDG is also as important when we talk about investing in our planet. So, so what can we do now? So hence the decision we make now to tackle uh, this uh, imminent threat will affect uh, our generations to come, including our ability to, to halt uh, global warming. The, the coronavirus uh, pandemic is a tragedy and its consequences will be felt for a long time. Yet, though global health conditions uh, will eventually return uh, to a form of normal, but our environment will never do so if we reach the tipping point. The COVID-19 pandemic is painfully showing us that our challenges are increasingly global in nature and require systemic solution. Hence, for global, uh, for climate change and, and other environmental, social, and economic issues, we need similar committed uh, global actions. A global commitment by every country in this planet is required to invest in our planet. So everyone has the ability to do, to do uh, something to address uh, our climate change here. I um, hands raised by some participant. Uh, okay. I hope every one of you can hear me clear. Are you able to hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. All right, so, uh, so today's discussion, uh, we are going to do a, a, a panel discussion on, on the topic of uh, investing in our planet in, in the various aspects. We share some of the things that uh, what we have also done here. So before I, I introduce the panel for our discussion today, let me first quickly show you that uh, what we have been doing at Distant. Over the past year at Distant College, uh, we have organized a series of activities and talks in conjunction with Earth Hour and also Earth Day. Uh, we will close this year's uh, Earth Day event with a panel discussion today on, on this very theme, Invest in Our Planet. We are also proud to formally launch uh, Distant's uh, latest sustainability mascot, and Dina and Teddy. So let me just run a short video here for you. Let's build our college mascots. Great idea. What should we name them? GI for Dina, TED for Teddy. Brilliant. Make Dina a cute and cool female dino. Wearing this the t-shirt. And Teddy, a nerdy male bear with a friendly smile. Make him wear glasses. Introducing Dina. Teddy. Hi there, I'm Dina, a new mascot for Distant. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Teddy, the other new mascot for Distant. It's great to meet you. We will help spread the word about Distant's commitment to supporting the 17 Sustainable Development Goals in all our activities and initiatives. Together, we can help spread awareness about these important goals and inspire people to take action. So if you see us around, don't be shy. Come say hi. And learn more about how Distant is working to make a difference. All right. So once again, uh, 
I would like to welcome our four panelists uh, who will be addressing the team uh, Invest in Our Planet. Um, the, the four panelists uh, include uh, Mr. Edwin Tan Biok Ek from the as the group CEO from Bonanza Venture Holding based in Ipoh. We also have Mr. J. Philip Vincent, uh, Group Director, GCH uh, Precision uh, Technology based in Penang. We have Associate Professor Dr. Devi uh, Binti Ahmad Sapwan, Director of Teaching and Learning based in Wawasan Open University in Penang. And also we have Mr. Tony Go, the Chairman of Malaysian Association of Hotels Penang. And also he is also the General Manager of the Wembley Penang and Citadel Express. Uh, so before I call each one of them to give their view uh, for about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, let me first introduce uh, our first panelist, Mr. Edwin Tan Bio Ek, who is the group CEO of Bonanza Venture Holdings. Uh, Edwin has been uh, with the group for 24 years and held various positions in the manufacturing positions before being appointed as group CEO. Currently, uh, BVH has four core businesses, uh, property development, leisure and hospitality, automobile and education. Edwin was involved in the construction of the state-of-the-art green headquarters of BVH in Ipoh and championing uh, the first green building index gold certified uh, car showroom in Malaysia with its Honda SS uh, 3S dealership, Ban Ho Singh Auto in Bandar Baru Sri Klebang in Ipoh. So with that, uh, let me uh, call Edwin to the floor. Uh, Edwin, you can share your screen now and take the presentation through. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Wick, Dr. Wick. Uh, thank you for the in introduction. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for giving me the privilege to share my thought first in, in, in among all the panelists. So um, I'm going to talk about the agenda, the great agenda in the property uh, sector. Okay, so um, next slide. Okay, so if you look into the property ecosystem, I personally, I, I, I categorize them into three stages. The first is um, deforestation. Okay, this is where uh, the property development uh, starts to, you know, uh, kill the environment by clearing the forest and to start building, uh, doing major earthwork, okay, prepare the site for, for, uh, for to build houses, okay. Then secondly, is the construction itself. It's the process of construction, uh, constructing the building. Okay, uh, the pollution uh, created, the noise, the dust. Okay, um, even if we, within the whole property called construction ecosystem, the production of building materials, the transportation of building materials, um, you know, all these contribute to uh, climate change today. And lastly, uh, is the building itself. So once the building is ready, people start to occupy. So people, uh, people start to occupy. So you have um, energy consumption, okay, greenhouse emissions, again, productions of waste by, by, by the habitants. Okay. So all this contributes to uh, the climate change issue today. But unfortunately, property sector is a sector that uh, we cannot neglect and it will not disappear because of urbanization. People need more houses, more offices to work in, you know. So the industry will have to continue no matter what. Um, therefore, um, it is very important that uh, for property developer like us to look into ways to make the industry more green and sustainable. Okay. So um, I think in Malaysia now, the, the awareness among uh, developers to be more green and sustainable in the developments are getting uh, greater and greater. And this afternoon, I would like to share with you um, a project that we just undertaken, okay, just finished um, in Ipoh, a uh, uh, building called One Lasam. 
okay, which is our headquarters, okay, which um, uh, we have, when we develop and design this building, we have green and sustainable elements behind um, our thought and design. And this building is the first and the only uh, GBI, Green Building Index, platinum building in the whole of Perak at this moment. Okay, so this is the building that I talk about, uh, one last time, our Bonanza Group corporate office. Okay, some, just some basic background about the, 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 the building. Okay, it is a five-story commercial building designed to be our um, headquarters, uh, 30,000 square feet of, of, of usable space. Okay, if you look at the pictures I, I attach here, you can look at the material, the choice of material that we use. It's actually very bare. Okay, we didn't do any uh, plastering. It is exposed concrete, brick bricks, no paint. Okay, this is uh, to, to minimize the use of chemicals, you know, paint and, and, and cement construction materials to the building. Okay, and of course, in a way, it's also save a bit of money. Lah. Okay, and if you look at the second picture, you can also see the design is such a way that we use a lot of glass, okay, to maximize uh, uh, natural lighting and also fresh air. Um, and we also have a, a, a central courtyard to encourage more fresh air, you know, natural ventilations to the office. Okay, so when we talk about green building, okay, uh, I think in Malaysia, we have a lot of, or a few authorities that actually certified what is a green building but for ourselves we actually is using uh, the green building index okay uh, we as mentioned earlier this is a platinum certified uh, building and we have scored 87 points okay so what makes us green okay in the eyes of uh, gbi green building index okay firstly uh, energy efficiency okay so in our building we use all LED lights, okay, um, and the design also in such a way like I mentioned earlier to maximize uh, natural uh, daylight, okay, natural ventilation, okay, and use of efficient lighting and lighting zone, and also we also have solar panel at the top of the building to generate uh, renewable energy, uh, use of efficient cooling system, aircon, then secondly is the indoor environment quality. Okay, so we also measure the welfare of the occupant. Okay, this is where we, uh, the building actually has a CO2 system, okay, to rate the air quality of the building. And the system actually allows us to actually uh, extract fresh air from, from outside if uh, the CO2 level of the building has reached a certain level. Okay, we're also concerned about uh, the, the lighting, lighting zone, every people have adequate lightings. We also measure the noise level, the acoustic level in the building, okay, to make sure the habitants, uh, the people that occupy the buildings uh, has, can have a good environment. Uh, we also do a post-occupancy survey to the occupants to get feedback and, and from them to how to improve the uh, environment of, of their working space, okay. Then we have, they also measure us in sustainable site planning and management. Okay, this is where we have to ensure the site we, we, we paid for the building has got uh, good public transport system. Okay, it, it's easily accessible. We have priority for green, green vehicle parking, over control during construction. Okay, and also we have a strong water design that's basically, uh, collects all surface water from the building, okay, before, or collect all surface water, filter any debris before we release the water to, to the drain. This is to uh, minimize the pollution to the drain, okay. Then we also have another element of material and resources. This is where uh, the, the choice of building materials, okay. Uh, the building materials that we pick to, to, to construct the building as mentioned earlier. First thing is we got to minimize whatever not necessary. Okay, for example, plastering, if you can avoid, we've got avoid. And the building itself, as mentioned, also have got no pain. We didn't use a single drip of pain in the whole building. 
Okay. Um, again, this aspect, we also look into uh, disposal of our construction waste. How do we manage them? Okay. And we send them, most of them to a, a licensed recycle, recycle center. So the waste is not being you know, discarded. We also look at water efficiency. Okay. So in the building, we have um, rainwater harvesting and recycling rainwater. Okay. So water from the tap, water tap uh, in the basin is actually recycled for cleaning purposes. Okay. Um, we also have water efficiency, efficient fittings. Okay. And we have water leaching, uh, leach management system to detect any leakages. Uh, in water okay so the last bit that they actually look at us is innovation so um again through careful thought actually the building has got a very low what we call concrete usage index that is where i mentioned earlier um again uh, with bare finish we managed to uh, reduce the use of some construction material and necessarily Okay, we also have a real-time building efficiency system, okay, to monitor our, 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 our power usage and also water usage, okay. And even uh, in one last time, okay, in our building here, uh, condensed water from the acorn is being channeled to the recycle um, uh, 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 tank, okay, for irrigation purposes. So that was how in Malaysia we we work with the GBI okay to achieve the green green uh, status and even within the uh, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals okay, our project actually achieved eight of the goals okay so namely good health and well being clean water and sanitization as I mentioned earlier that is the the uh, Rainwater harvesting system. Affordable and clean energy, that's the solar panel. Okay. Sustainable city and communities. And I forgot to mention just now, uh, most of our construction material, we actually source locally. Okay, this is to minimize the transportation of, of uh, a construction material from factory to site, also to look, support the local community. Okay, then is the next one is goal number 12, responsible consumption and production. Again, this was mentioned earlier also uh, <clears throat> with the GBI. This is the choice of uh, construction material with recycled content and how do we dispose um, uh, construction debris. Okay. The next one is climate action. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the whole building has got no pain. Okay, and we didn't use uh, uh, sealants as well for. Then the next one is life underwater. Okay, um, as mentioned also earlier, all surface water collected from the building is being filtered. Okay, into this bioswale before the water is being released to 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 the to the to the drain. Okay, so all debris, everything we will we will we will keep in the building and don't discharge to the to the main drain. Okay, and life, uh, lastly is life on land. Uh, I think this was briefly mentioned by Professor Vic earlier. Um, nowadays, because of an, an, an irresponsible development, okay, irresponsible people that without proper planning, okay, it has caused a lot of climate change issue to, to, to us. So, uh, of course, we comply with all the uh, requirements from the council. Okay, and also the timber product we use is 100% recyclable or sustainable. Okay, so this is the uh, snapshot of our building management system. Okay, so it monitors the, um, the water that we use, the water that we collect from the rainwater, okay, uh, the, water, the energy that we, we generate from our solar panels. And we look at the um, the BEI here, okay, uh, which stands for Building Energy Index, okay, we are running at 30 of 29 kilowatt per hour, which is actually extremely efficient. Uh, according to GBI, 
anything below 90% is actually quite efficient. Okay, so what I just mentioned is the building itself, how we design, how we build. Okay, but we actually go one step further. Uh, after having the building, okay, how we fit up the building. Okay, if you look at here, okay, we the building itself, how we use it, we, we, we um, emphasis on the three R, we use, reduce, and recycle. Okay, uh, the landscape that we had, we actually bring it all over from our, our, uh, our other properties, our other development, okay. Uh, old furniture are being reused to, to sorry. Yeah, old furniture are being reused, okay. Uh, broken parts of our old buggy in our golf course, our leisure uh, 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 um, uh, business is being used as structure. Okay, so we try to reuse whatever we have left from our other property. So, as mentioned earlier as well, this building is supposed to be our headquarters, whereby uh, some key personnel or some people will, after he has completed, will, will move to this building. But after two years or two and a half years of lockdown or MCO, we are so used to meeting online, you know, work remotely. So finally we decided, no, we will not put everybody together. Okay, we will keep our colleagues where they are at their respective offices. So we end up with a lot of open, I mean, uh, a new space in, 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 in the building. So in that respect also, we also go one step further uh, beyond environment along the ESG ecosystem, we went into social. Okay, so um, nice about seventy percent of the space of the building currently uh, is being used by NGO or not for profit organization. To name a few, uh, we have Para Academy, which uh, houses their resource center there. Ipo Eco, which is a community, uh, Ipo local community. Uh, social platform, okay, they also have their office here. Ipo World uh, is a museum for display. Um, we also like to share our experience with uh, uh, people and through word of mouth and, 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 and um, you know, our friends, okay, we have been uh, receiving education receipts from university students, uh, the Malaysian Green Council uh, people. And we also now is the host for uh, NGO called Bogan Villa City Dementia Cafe, which they have their workshop in our place once a month for their members to share experience and have their, their, their forum. Okay, and we are also quite proud that our, our effort in this sustainable building has caught, uh, received a bit of recognition from the industry. Uh, for information, the building actually was completed in January 2022, January last year. So we are this year, this is the second year. So last year, we actually have won two awards. Uh, one is the uh, PAM Award in for Silver in Sustainable Development and also the H PAM Green Excellence Award. Okay, so that a bit of uh, sharing of what we have done at our uh, HQ at IPO. So I think uh, just to align back with what the topic of today, uh, invest, okay, for the green. Um, I think in this investment, in this, this, this uh, it, um, property that we developed, uh, through a conversation with one of the members of the PAM, okay, they actually, one thing that actually surprised them is actually the cost for us to invest to do this is actually comparable to invest in an ordinary building. Okay, because a lot of time um, when it comes to green building, a lot of people will, will, will uh, think of it will cost a lot more to incorporate all this green building there. But in our building here, after we have completed, um, of course, with careful thought and, and, and design, actually our cost is actually comparable to, to uh, uh, building an ordinary building. Therefore, 
Invest in green building is definitely worth it. Of course, if you look at the long-term saving from the solar panel, the, the water bill that we save is definitely uh, the way to go for, for in the property sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Edwin, for running us through uh, some of the amazing work that uh, uh, BBH is doing in, in EPO, and we really hope uh, this will be something that everyone can can uh, emulate, uh, not just in EPO, but I think all over Malaysia. So before I uh, proceed to call the next uh, panelist to share his view, maybe it's the right time for us to do a, a quick screenshot of whoever is here today. Uh, so I would like to just call everyone to just uh, on your video just for a few minutes so that my colleague, uh, Felicia, you're here, uh, you can take a snapshot of uh, who is here today. Uh, we have so called 52, I think it was 55, it dropped to 52 now. So you will have people trickling in and out, uh, it's fine. As I've said, the recording will be made available uh, to all. We also have a group of students there, I can see viewing from one of the classrooms. Uh, everyone can on their video. Felicia, are you ready to capture? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's uh, give a good smile of the first screenshot here. Okay, Felicia, once you're done, you let us know. Felicia and Ben, Ben is here um, as well. Okay, but I, I don't know why I can't show my face. Huh? Okay, can I idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. First shot. Yeah. yeah. Who else? Okay. Uh, next page, right? Wait. Okay, next screen. Next page. Second. Okay, next screen now is on. Uh, so I see some of you have not on your video. It's okay if you can't, not able to on. So uh, the rest would like to on before I snapshot. Yeah, yeah, they are owning. Uh, okay, we will wait for a while, yeah? Okay. Uh, so. Uh, it's okay. Okay, it's so okay. I will I will take now. Yeah. Wait la. Okay. All right, Felicia. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for, for switching our cameras on. Okay, we're going to move on uh, to our next speaker. Uh, let me share the screen. For our next speaker, we have Mr. J. Philip Finson, uh, who is the Group Director of JCH Precision Technology in Penang. He started his working career in auditing at, uh, in auditing at SGV, Kasim and Chan and Company, which is now called Deloitte. And thereafter, he started his own manufacturing business in 1990 at Bayan Lepas, jointly with his partners and led his company to uh, publicly listed in 1998. Thereafter, uh, expanded to Thailand, Philippines, China, and India to cater uh, precision engineering, equipment design, and assembly and automation for the global semiconductor MNCs. He existed the listed companies in 2003 to join GCH Precision Technology, whereby currently uh, taking the company uh, towards uh, IR 4.0, IoT and MI, focusing on companies' uh, growth and building up uh, talent pool to enable to meet the demanding challenge. He's also a great advocate for SME's uh, ecosystem. So with that, uh, let me hand over the session uh, to Mr. Vincent. Over to you, Mr. Vincent. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Vicky, and uh, good afternoon to everyone, especially uh, to my good friend, Mr. Tony, uh, and few others who are all here today. 
uh, and uh, also uh, I, I I see that was uh, a very well presented uh, GBI uh, input from Edwin Tan, which is uh, very interesting uh, for the commercial and business uh, buildings. Uh, what they call uh, we welcome more activities such kind like that in the uh, industry zone. But there are a lot of factories who are all having similar GBI for the industry standards, which I think we should have about the five such kind of buildings in Penang, uh, which is very welcoming. And uh, without much ado, let me uh, uh, do the, uh, I mean, uh, have the pleasure of just sharing some of the slides that we have started our ESG in-house together with MPC, which is called the uh, Malaysian Productivity Corporation, which is a government agency under METI. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, basically MPC, as you can see on the slide, uh, they have launched their ECG corporate uh, strategy sometime around in January, 2023. And uh, what they have done is that they are spreading their uh, sharing uh, of their ECG activities to industries, uh, especially uh, in the 11 productivity nexus to ensure all 17 sustainable development goals proposed by the government are achieved. The definition of the ESG MPC, which uh, is been tabled out as follows on E, is to focus on the environmental protection by reducing pollution, waste, and carbon footprint. And the carbon footprint reduction can be accelerated using digital technologies in process management as well as information gathering. And uh, hold on. Huh? On uh, S, uh, there is a focus on social to ensure, ensure respect of human rights and labor rights and help citizens to earn better wages and escape poverty. In addition to high providing jobs and sharing of wealth between employers and employees through the final products is also crucial. Finally, G, focusing to governance to strengthen the law in the public and private sectors from any misconduct. These initiatives will prevent the reference to bribery in transaction, drafting laws and regulation, including amendments, through behavior insights is one of the ways governance can reduce the cost of compliance. Next. Okay. Uh, approach of the MPC EC, ECG uh, ESG uh, initiative. The MPC ESG initiative is based on the government's plan under the objectives on the 12th Malaysia plan and is tailored to Malaysian Productivity Action Plan. This is basically meant for a lot of production uh, of uh, industries and manufacturers in Malaysia, not only for Penang, throughout Malaysia. Anybody could uh, collaborate together with the Malaysian Productivity Corporation. Each initiative introduced by the MPC is focused on the following, future talent development, technology adoption, favorable business uh, regulation, productive, incentive through industry structure and productive mind of Malaysia. These initiatives for all the 11 productivity nexus thus measure all ESG elements. Next. Okay, the MPC ESG framework, uh, which may not be the same with others, but uh, it is basically designed for industry users and manufacturers, and it, it is applied to everyone. And most of the uh, points that have been uh, colored in the uh, round circle uh, may change from time to time as per the company's needs. So, uh, uh, and these slides are available for anyone who wish to, uh, what they call, go through. And that, that this is the final slides I have. Uh, and uh, probably after this, I will just uh, share uh, the areas that we have uh, uh, our journey on ESG in our factory. Uh, is there anything, uh, Prof, before we uh, have a further um, briefing of my company's activity? You, you can go on the, uh, ah, explain okay. a bit about the company before okay. we, we pull the next uh, presenter. Sure. Uh, okay, basically, I think most of the uh, companies uh, which we see in Penang as well as in other countries and I mean other states in Malaysia, uh, ESGs, it always sum up to donation, cleaning up uh, tamans and uh, giving don uh, what you call a uh, hampers and so on. This is also part of uh, the ESG program, but then there's a lot of things behind it. 
we are looking into, especially in the manufacturing sector, to reduce the carbon footprint, especially the waste. So uh, as for our company, I can only talk for my company. I would not be comparing with other company, uh, other factories in Bailapas. Uh, probably some would have adopted in a very high level. And especially, I should agree that uh, multinational corporation, especially the uh, foreign-based companies, are fully compliant to a lot of these ESG, uh, ESG matters and uh, including the RBA matters. So as such, uh, the local companies, especially the SME sectors, which we have right now, uh, which we have about 600 over SMEs in Penang, and most of them uh, are adopting and implementing certain strategies in their companies, not to say all of them are adopting the 17 elements, but a few elements which is within their scope that they can handle. But uh, we see that uh, as what uh, what they call uh, Edwin Tan has uh, claimed that cost is a factor. And uh, if he can say that in the uh, construction sector, for the manufacturing sector, for people like SMEs, local like us, cost is always a, sec uh, is a big issue for us. So to implement certain uh, elements into our ESG programs in our factory, a lot of consolidated efforts is required, especially cutting down costs or to implement certain software uh, programs to monitor our activities. And uh, along here, we uh, the government has uh, also um, uh, set up uh, uh, BUSA Carbon Exchange, which is a subsidiary of BUSA Malaysia. And there are lack of traders uh, who would be able to help uh, factories, companies, construction companies to have carbon footprint critics. So this is another issue. The framework is not fully compliant at this point of time throughout Malaysia, uh, knowing the fact that there are so many industries with so many kind of ways and uh, so many different type of carbon footprints. How are we going to uh, synergize all these to uh, claim the credits? But before claiming the credits, we need to implement certain uh, 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 regulations within the factory and uh, like I used to tell to my guys in my factory that uh, ESG starts at home not in your company it starts at home uh, right from your bedroom to your kitchen to every part of your house then you bring it back to the house I mean bring, bring it back to our factory so it, it starts from home so uh, ESG is not a, a, a business by itself, but then it's a consolidation effort of all uh, staffs that we have in our factory moving towards that direction. And uh, I think uh, we have uh, done a lot of improvement ever since uh, during the COVID uh, MCO time, where we implemented uh, ERP system, uh, machine integration system and uh, there's a lot of uh, reconstruction of our factory activities inside our factory uh, premises itself where by reducing workforce and increasing our productivity and uh, the software systems that we have implemented helped us a lot but there's a long way for us to uh, carry on with our activity towards ESG towards full compliance so uh, we look forward uh, on, on any, any areas that we can uh, collaborate and uh, work together, together with the uh, district. And uh, if there is any questions that you would like to raise over during the Q&A session, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent, uh, for giving us a snapshot of what's happening in the industry. I like the, the, the term that you use, ESG starts from home. Indeed, uh, uh, the beginning is always at home and then you take it to wherever you, you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Then. On another yeah. note, I'll just uh, uh, tell you that it, the, the factories that uh, have started uh, greatly on ESG and green, uh, there are a few factories, you know, like uh, in Penang, I would name uh, MLS, uh, Parabit, uh, including uh, B Brown. And then uh, there quite a number of them have restarted uh, that uh, journey. And I think they are a big role model for us. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, MLS, which is a local based company, which is a listed company, they have done a beautiful structure within the factory where they reduce the uh, usage of aircon, but it is so cooling inside and uh, in, including uh, Vitrox too. So uh, these are a few companies in Penang which has done very well. Uh, they should be a role model for us. And uh, we look more more such factories to come up with such kind of uh, initiative. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. We'll discuss more at the, at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So next, uh, I would like to call upon our third uh, panelist today, uh, uh, Dr. Devi Binti Ahmad Sapwan, who is an associate professor in organizational behavior and also the director for teaching and learning at Wawasan Open University. She also leads the Center for ODL Experience, uh, uh, overseeing a team of interaction, uh, user interface, and digital learning uh, designers, as well as LMS administrators. Uh, Devi has been an academic for over 22 years, and prior to that, she served in the shipping industry. She has deep interest in phenomenological studies, specifically uh, paradoxically angled behavioral areas of human potentials and emotions. Okay, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Devi is currently uh, pursuing a master's degree in applied criminology and penology at the University of Cambridge. So her presentation today is going to be slightly taking a different turn, bringing the whole notion of uh, gender inequality when you talk about uh, the changes that is happening, uh, even when you talk about investing in our planet, what is the role uh, of, of, uh, of ensuring there is uh, gender inequality here? So, so I'll hand over the session now to Dr. Davy to take over. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll be going um, niche in my sharing uh, today, which is looking into the challenges women leaders in higher education are experiencing while ensuring for a sustainable future. Um, therefore, I'll be specifically focusing on SDG 5, which is on gender equality. Um, and this is a critical element needed to drive another initiative towards um, SDG 4, which is ensuring inclusivity and equitability of uh, quality education and promoting lifelong learning, which is all relevant to um, what we're doing now um, in higher education. So as you, you can see on the screen, last year, we was an open university together with the uh, Commonwealth of Learning organized a training program on leadership for sustainability at our campus in Penang. The, the, let me share with you that the, the Commonwealth of Learning is actually an organization hosted by the Canadian government um, to promote uh, open and distance learning education to the Commonwealth citizens around the globe. Um, and Wawasan Open University has been working with Commonwealth of Learning for the past many years, you know, since 2018, and conducting programs advocating women to lead transformative uh, tra transformations in open learning institutions. So I'd like to if, um, use this platform, uh, take the opportunity to briefly share some insights um, gathered from the participants who attended this program. Um, and these are the insights that we, we gathered through our research with my colleague, uh, Dr. Josephine Chan, uh, just recently, and it's currently uh, under review for publication. Right, um, next please. So in talking about gender equality, uh, let's briefly recall what happened to us as we manage ourselves during the pandemic, if you, if you can. Um, we could observe how the pandemic has really magnified the role of women in society, working women in society, especially on the front line and at home. Um, and what is now apparent is that we have this long standing structural inequalities um, experience across all realms. And it has already served as a wake up call and economies around the world about the importance of placing women at the center of any efforts, um, efforts to recover from the pandemic and to manage during now the post pandemic. Um, another evidence, next please, which, it, which is on inequality um, is found in the United Nations Women Reports on Gender Response Tracker. And they captured that there was, uh, at the point of this report, 20% of 206 countries around the world have, ha have had no gender sensitive measures implemented at all. All right, so, so this is another evidence to um, the structural issues around the world. 
Next, please. And of course, we've got numerous past studies that substantiate the role of women as key um, in our pursuance towards a sustainable world. And in these studies, it's mentioned that uh, women leaders are more concerned about climate change and its potential effects on future generations as compared to men. And they also found uh, that women leaders are also particularly well suited to lead all the efforts on doing something about, about this challenge. Um, however, despite all this evidence on the will and the ability of women, Unfortunately, there still is this disconnect that we find in terms of what we think should be done and putting those words into action, right? So I think this is a problem not unique to women and it cuts, cuts across all leaders in general. Um, next, please. So this illustration that you can see in the middle of the, the screen, um, it may be somewhat outdated, but I wanted to share this to show that even back then in 2013, that there were more women who were educated and remain in longer in education as compared to men. And this can be seen in areas which are red in color. So um, what I'm trying to imply here is that women are capable to lead transformation in education based on the knowledge and the experience that they have. Um, the problem is now, although we see all these evident, evidences and we, we, we observe them ourselves, um, it's not the case, especially in our developing countries. So Vietnam, for example, actually has laws to reduce gender inequality. However, even with laws, uh, they still have very few women as leaders in their higher education. Um, so in general, what still stands now as a challenge for everyone is the perception or, or the perceived notion that um, men comes with toughness, you know? So unfortunately, um, toughness is always equated to performance and which may not necessarily be the case. Um, next, next slide, please. And so from our study, uh, the insights that we gathered in conclusion is that we've got four elements um, that we need to act upon and address in order to be able to support women leaders in higher education pursue um, sustainable future. Number one, um, women leaders must be provided with mentorship um, because mentorship will provide them the safe space to grow and to have access to networks, networks and other connections. Um, number two, we need to encourage more and allow women to create stronger networks to help them enact this change. Number three, um, we need to empower women in ICT because at present still, and we can also see in Malaysia, um, that the field and the discipline is still dominated by men. And women leaders require these skill sets and the knowledge to be able to leverage on um, new technologies and as well as social media platforms to accelerate their, uh, the progress of their initiatives. And lastly, number four, we need to ease the way for women to champion this climate change issues. And in terms of higher education, this can be done through um, transforming the curriculum and encouraging more community uh, community projects uh, initiated by the universities. So that's briefly um, the outcome of our, our research. And before I, I, I end my presentation, um, if I could pose a question for later to the panel, my question is, um, honestly, what is the current situation in your sectors now in terms of women participation in leadership 
outfits in your sectors. And, and you think your sectors are sensitive to gender, in, uh, gender equality. That's all, Nick. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Devi, for giving us another uh, angle of our discussion today, which will be interesting for us to chat uh, later on, including the question that you have posed today. All right. So now, last but not least, we have our last panelist today, uh, Mr. Tony Go, the general manager of Wembley and Penang and Citadel Express Penang. He is a renowned uh, seasonal hotelier and he's also known to take pride in whatever he does. Uh, he was a general manager at Citadel Mid Valley Kuala Lumpur and Citadel Penang. Uh, Tony, uh, who is a graduate from La Roche, uh, the prestigious hotel school in Switzerland, brings with him an extensive uh, 38 years of experience in the service and hospitality industry. Today, as the chairman of the Malaysian Association of Hotels, the Penang chapter, his aspiration is to make the services for Penang hotels unforgettable for all tourists and also supporting the green agenda is certainly, uh, I'm sure, is one of them, which is what he's going to share with us today. So I will open the floor now to Tony uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as already done in the brief introductions, uh, just to let everyone know a little bit of MA. MA is actually Malaysia Association of Hotels. Uh, we are the Penang chapter. Currently, we have about 95 uh, members uh, with a room inventory of about 15,000 room inventory. Um, I think before I go into this environmental thing, uh, that I think the hotel has been already talking about environmental issue in the 80s already. I still remember those days where we talk about no shafin. There's one of those areas that we talk about environment. Uh, everybody was trying to persuade the hotel to go into no shafin and and it was very difficult. A lot of hotels did not take the challenge because of uh, guest requirement. The, the uh, wedding without a shafin is not a standard quality. And of course, with education, exposure, uh, better understanding. And today, almost every hotel don't have a shafin. As you say, I think all hotels don't have shafin anymore. You go from that to smoking and the non-smoking hotel. Now uh, we are talking about uh, housekeeping. Housekeeping whereby uh, a lot of hotel now is not is going into no daily cleaning services. Uh, practically, of course, it started with uh, the pandemic. We didn't want to have uh, too much contact with our staff and the guests to protect them and protect us. Also at a time where we don't have enough staff. Okay, but earlier on, uh, hotel did try. Hotel did try to do it uh, on no daily cleaning because of environment. We did not want to have too much washing, uh, usage of water, detergent going into the drainage. So we encourage the guests not to have daily cleaning uh, based on one three service uh, one three from the guests, but. I think after the pandemic, uh, a lot of hotels have decided this will be the policy for the guests that there's no daily cleaning unless you want to especially request for it. Uh, so, so these are the environment thing that a lot of hotels is slowly moving into it. Of course, um, I didn't want to put the slides because there's so many things. The uh, hotel started with all these three R, recycle, reuse, and reduce. And then now we are in the ESG. That means, uh, it is part of the requirement. So a lot of the hotels uh, over the years have already done a lot of things and uh, uh, to reduce the, uh, to improve the environment. Uh, the most uh, impact one that the hotel use, usage in, I mean the usage is plastic in the hotel. We have plastic bottle, we have plastic bag, we have plastic laundry bag, we have all plastic. And uh, even amenities are in plastic. Uh, packing and all these things. So I think hotel has went uh, into reducing the plastic usage. 
we have hotel have changed from uh, laundry bag into non plastic uh, paper uh, plastic bag for food is no longer in plastic. Uh, we the mineral water that we we are giving is now a lot of them is moving into a glass bottle or water dispenser. Uh, still a lot of hotels still using those plastic, but I think it will be something like uh, non smoking and the uh, shuffling thing where education is there when the customers start to understand it uh, slowly. Uh, hotels are moving that, that way. In fact, our hotel is going to water dispenser. And uh, same thing, room amenities, those they are in plastic packaging and then they went to recycle packaging, uh, shampoo, uh, as well as uh, Soap and all these things now are in this in dispenser. There's no longer uh, going to be in individual plastic packing and all these things. So again, this is no longer in using the plastic. F and B also in terms of banquet service. Those days we give a lot of mineral water, each one one bottle and all these things. Today we don't. We give glass bottle. We we fill up the water from a good dispenser and then we provide. Uh, drinking water for meeting packages and so. So uh, I think where most of the hotels will one day move to almost completely doing, I would say that 80-90% without plastic. New hotel buildings are also, as mentioned earlier on, we're building, they have considered a lot of other things in environment. Uh, we are talking about harvesting rainwater and a lot of new buildings, hotel, we use water from the rain uh, to for the flushing system in the in the room and all these things. So water is being harvested from the rain also, and also that the uh, energy wise, solar we are also moving into solar. But space is a is a challenge for hotel because uh, for solar to be. Uh, to put solar in a hotel, we need a good high, uh, a good space, which a lot of hotel doesn't have it. But uh, I, I mean, the associations, in fact, has spoken to some uh, people who are doing solar, and hopefully it will materialize that they will produce the solar and sell it to us from from a certain location. It's almost like TMB. Uh, TMB did try uh, to move solar or renewable uh, energy into the hotel, but I think. Too many demand. <laughs> they are not able to meet so much demand yet. But definitely, hotel is there. Those hotels that can. Oh. Can hear you, Tony. No worries. Sorry. I'll press something. Those no, hotels no, no. that uh, uh, who have the space, uh, I have known that there are hotels that already went into the renewable. Uh, uh, energy and all this, and also in terms of uh, uh, energy saving or not you to reduce uh, the consumption of electricity and all this thing, a lot of hotels has went into uh, managing their uh, air con uh, temperature. Many have installed in uh, uh, either AI or sensor in their rooms to to manage the temperature, especially uh, overnight when the guest is already sleeping and to manage the temperature into a comfortable temperature and also to reduce the usage of the electricity. Uh, so there are so many things on this and we have also uh, tried to uh, educate the guests on what we are doing to make sure that they are also helping us in energy service uh, energy conservation and also uh, to uh, reduce uh, wastage on water. Uh, these are the things that we do. And I think we have done a lot more on all this. Uh, community wise, uh, we even work with state government uh, to sponsor, I mean, from MA, we sponsored uh, on the planting of trees. Uh, and we do Gotong Royong in the beaches. Uh, from the hotel itself. So in the community-wise, in terms of working with the authority, we are also moving into that. We are encouraging also, uh, you know, many hotels now have has 
uh, EV charger for cars that are using EV and um, and uh, it is free of charge at this moment. <laughs> most of the most of them are providing free of charge EV charger for the electric car. And uh, even the kitchen cooking oil has been uh, collected by uh, uh, collected by contractor so that they can be reused for other purposes and not flow into the uh, grid strap. Uh, so these are the things that uh, hotels are doing, and I think there are much more things that hotels are doing in terms of environment, and we are definitely uh, still moving forward toward this situ uh, this this uh, direction. Thank you. Hello. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Tony, for giving us an overview of uh, the, the changes that is happening uh, as well in, in the hotel and tourism industry, which is also an important industry for, for Penang. All right, so we go into our discussion. We have about 25 minutes to run through our discussion. So, uh, so maybe uh, let me pose a few questions first before I, I open uh, to the floor. Uh, maybe a general question that uh, I want to ask, uh, maybe I know the three panelists, uh, you, uh, you've been uh, directly talking about the environment and then we have Dr. Davy. I have one on talking about uh, gender inequality. Maybe a general question for the, the three panelists is uh, uh, in terms of uh, government incentives, uh, I think one of the most important thing is how do we uh, encourage the industry, whichever industry, the hospitality industry, the property, the manufacturing, how can, is the current government incentive sufficient for the industry to be more green? Um, is that enough given? Uh, we have talked. We have talked about this for the past uh, one decade now, and uh, and uh, right from the, the the green cars coming, the hybrid cars coming, and then the manufacturing moving into to uh, uh, environmentally friendly approach of, of of managing, and then the hotel has gone into that. The tourism industry has gone. But do you think that uh, it is sufficient, or the the incentive that the government has come up for your respective industry is is good enough for for the industry to be more encouraged to, to move into being more green. Maybe, maybe I'll start with uh, with Edwin. What what is your your view? Uh, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you for the question. Um. Currently, actually, uh, the government do have a bit of um um incentive. Uh, in terms of capital allowance, okay, um, uh, for for uh, people like us doing green, green, green building, okay. But if you ask me whether that is enough or not, I would say maybe not yet yeah, because uh, capital I mean tax incentive is something that you need to pay first, okay. You 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 you, know, you have to come up with the investment first, okay. Then only you get the tax tax incentive, you know. In the future, so the capital front is actually quite, quite uh, can be can be, I mean, you don't have get much incentive in that respect, okay. But I do have to say, I mean, uh, one thing is the about the, the the SC now, okay, the 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 uh, not SC the the Energy Commission, okay. I think they are now the the process of in terms of the solar power, okay, the installation and and. And getting the quota, I guess the process or the or the I mean the to, to get it actually is has become easier compared with the previous years. Okay. Uh last time you have to go through a lot of paperwork, you know, this and that to get it, and there's always enough quota. But I think for the past few years, okay, this the process to get um uh um your approval to install solar panel. Okay, has sort of been, uh, been made easier. Okay, although uh, the current system of the NEM, the net metering system, two point zero or three point zero, had its both pro and cons. Okay, that one have and I go have for another, uh, debate or discussion on that. But I guess in that respect, the energy commission has become more friendly. Okay, in 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 um, issuing uh, permissions to install solar panels. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Um, Vincent, what do you think? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, on this matter, uh, it's very crucial just to uh, further echo what Edwin has uh, just mentioned. Uh, when you talk about uh, funding this initiative uh, in uh, in a company, especially the local based companies, you need funds and uh, either government grants or something like that, or tax incentives. But uh, on another point, we have this ESG regulatory framework, which is not been uh, properly enforced uh, to all the local companies. So it is still uh, floating around. And as such, uh, when we talk about uh, ESG initiative, funding is always an issue. Uh, but nevertheless, most of the companies have taken their own initiative in a very small way, uh, not complying to all the 17 elements, but uh, one or two for a start. And uh, one example that uh, we have uh, committed with the MPC Malaysian Productivity uh, Corporation, where we work together with them on uh, scaling up our activities, is uh, 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 on investment. So the investment would be number one priority for the local SME, especially the manufacturers, will be the equipments that we are buying from overseas. So, for example, we have uh, old machines, which we term that uh, in the general term is the legacy machines, which we are trading off and buying in new machines. So when the new machine comes in, that it is fully IoT and IR4.0 compliance. So that's a lot of uh, what you call um, incentives that we can get, especially uh, reducing waste. Uh, there's not much of uh, uh, inputs of uh, raw materials is required to uh, what you call to cool down the machine, especially the uh, coolants. So uh, a lot of things that we can uh, really do, but can the local company invest in such kind of uh, initiative on their own? It's quite tough. Because uh, we, we are not comparing ourselves with the multinational corporations, with they all are being uh, what you call uh, funded by their HQ. But then for people like uh, local companies like us, we have tier one suppliers, tier two suppliers, and tier three suppliers. Each of them have their own portfolio of their services. But uh, basically, the tier one and tier two will be uh, quite heavy investment on the equipments. So as a result, uh, most of the factories here, especially the tier one, tier two, have invested on new machines, which uh, has reduces a lot of costs, including carbon footprint. And uh, along the line, uh, uh, water harvesting in the factory, uh, it's all been started. And then uh, we are now uh, in initiating having uh, solar panels in our roof. Uh, so these are small initiatives they are doing uh, for a start since uh, uh, I think we started off sometime around in February 2023. Uh, a long way to go. It's a journey. It's a process that we all are committed to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, Tony, uh, how about the, the hospitality and tourism industry? How, what, is, what is the uh, current support uh, by the government in terms of uh, I know there's tourism tax and all that, but how? what are the other tax incentives or any other incentive that is given uh, for, for the people and also for the industry to be more green? Uh, your mic, uh, Tony. You're muted, Tony. Okay. Sorry. I said the Penang, uh, Penang State Government did try to do something. They came up with the uh, Green Office Certification uh, so that we had to follow certain criteria and, and they gave a certain discount from your assessment, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in a small way. Uh, to us is that, I think to us, uh, Hotelier is um, uh, going green is what we want to go to. Okay, you give me a little bit or don't give me a little bit, that is not, um, to, to us, I don't think uh, it make a big impact. Uh, although it is nice to have. Uh, but I think the major area is still from the federal government, especially on the electricity. With the ICPT kicking into the picture, <laughs> oh, the, the energy uh -huh. cost has went up 36.5%. Correct, correct. Okay. So every everyone, I think, regardless of business, would be very willing to go into solar energy. This is, again, uh, where is the availability? 
I think there was something earlier last month or so where they say that they are coming out with this uh, renewable uh, thing and you can you you can go in to the online and apply before you even apply it's already taken off there's no more slot for you to take off so I think that the, it, it, you know the government want to do something but it is not accessible to us we could not wish it we cannot get it and for us it's not that we we, we don't want to do the the, the solar it's because we don't have the uh, facility or the space to do the solar, right? Uh, the return on investment now will be very easy because 36.5% of the energy costs, uh, you recover back whatever you're going to put there. And I think there's a tax incentive for that also. Huh? So, uh, so I think important thing is that not only saying that you want to give uh, 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 incentive, but is it reachable to us or not? That's the issue. That's the issue. It, it's not reachable to us. Nice to say, nice to have, but we cannot get. Okay. So in terms of hotel, as I say that we will go all the way. Anything to do with environment and all these things, we will always support. We will always move forward. As I say, even Shafin today is no longer served in hotel. Huh? So we will move forward. Uh, whichever way it is. Uh, it's also that um, it's part of business anyway. Right, for us to, uh, to be also uh, progressing along with the environment thing that we need to do. But I say that I think at the moment the most important thing is the energy. Uh, we want we we don't mind, you know. I think a lot of us don't mind even investing in the solar energy, but or to get the solar energy, but it's not reaching us now. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, Tony. Um, I have a question for for Davy uh, uh, on on the on the topic that you've uh, brought forward today. Uh, uh, Davy, do you think uh, in terms of uh, uh, leadership, environmental leadership, uh, do you think uh, you, we have seen across the past many years uh, women leaders coming up uh, fighting for environment, uh, young young kids uh, also you see that happening. So in terms of environmental leadership, do you think uh, women can play a, a, a more effective role uh, compared to the to the men, which is the majority now that you see? But uh, and, and what's what's your view uh, when when you talk about environmental uh, leadership across the globe, even yeah. in Malaysia for them? Um, fortunately, I I shared that evidence, the scientific evidence, saying that it's proven that women can be a better leader when um, promoting climate change uh, initiatives. Right, so so that's proven already. And um, um, but the challenge is, of course, uh, still there. And the challenge, I mean, we need to to address the challenge, and it's because I. I think I can also address another similar uh, question, which I, I read from the chat box. Um, my answer to that is that we still live in a patriarchal world, except for some areas in the Western countries or the Scandinavian countries um, are not, but uh, Malaysian specifically, we're still very con conventional in our ways. And so uh, in patriarchy, for women, regardless of their experience, their will, their education, their ability, their drive, their spirit, <laughs> we still feel that um, there is more expected from us and that we need to still prove ourselves. Um, secondly, um, I feel that there is um, that unconscious or subconscious gender bias still going that way because of the lack of awareness, we're not, um, we're not aware that we are biased most of the time. And, and that this translates into discrimination um, at workplace practices. And therefore, of course, you get consequences in how you um, promote, how you recruit. Let me share, I have been in the same room as a decision maker who said that we're not hiring any more women because it's just going to be problematic when they go on maternity. And for Malaysia, on one hand, it's been good for women because uh, the act, um, they've just um, 
had a, a change in the act where maternity leave has been extended to 98 days from 60 days. But on the other hand, we have this kind of discrimination still going on. So that's quite unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you, Davy. I think Davy also uh, responded to the question in the chat by uh, Hadeep Chakur uh, uh, Tabira. So if I move on to the uh, next question in the chat uh, for Edwin and also Tony. Uh, I first question on to Edwin. May I know where do you store the used grey water for cleaning? How much is the tank capacity? How do you collect the surrounding building water to discharge to the drain? So that's the first question for Edwin. Edwin, you're muted. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm checking again. Okay. How do or where do I? So actually, we in the building we do have a a space dedicated you know, for the rainwater harvesting tank and the grey water tank. Okay, so it is at the back of the of the building. Okay. Um uh, that is where we store it. Okay, for actually the usage is more for general um uh, cleaning, okay, uh, cleaning of the of the of the road and the building. Because um of the treatment system that we have actually it is not advisable to use it to for for actually uh, even for 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 irrigation for, for for watering of plants, okay, that is a recommendation from the consultant. Uh, but we do use it for general cleaning of the surrounding. Um, then the okay, the capacity um is not more, I'm not mistaken, it's not very big. It's about uh two hundred gallon, okay. And actually, one of the requirement in the GBI is actually we have the 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 recycling water have to be about ten percent of our water usage. Okay, the uh the water we collect have to be about ten percent of our total water usage for the whole building. Okay, and the third question is how do you collect surrounding building water to discharge to the drain? Um, the the pumping system, the system is designed in such a way that um, all the rainwater, the surface water, okay, the water that is that we need to discharge to the drain, is all go to what we call a bioswale. Okay, that is where actually it, uh, we have a filter. Okay, uh, before this bioswale connect to the to the main drain outside, so we have a central collection point, so where we can collect all the waters. Um, or filter the debris as mentioned earlier filter the debris keep the debris and you have to of course maintain the filter clear the debris occasionally and only we only discharge uh filtered or clean water into the uh the the main drain okay all right yeah. thank you thank you thank you edwin for that tony uh, there's a question for you uh what are the uses of the used cooking oil uh, um, and how often is it collected? Okay, <clears throat> the cooking oil is collected by an outside contractor. Okay, and uh, I think they are come and collect it weekly basis. We will keep the oil and they will come and collect it weekly basis. I think so. I'm not sure how many days. And, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, I think they are using this cooking oil to make soap or something like that. I'm not sure what the contractor do with, but we we will let this contractor collect the oil, filter it, collect the oil, and uh, where they will they have their uses. So I I don't know what they use, but I did ask before. They said they they I was told that they might use it for making soap. So I'm not sure what they can do with it, but definitely they're not using it to resell for cooking oil. That they cannot do it. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I'd like to open the floor further. If anyone want to ask directly, then uh, I can unmute you. Okay, I have one uh, question here. Uh, let me unmute. Okay, you, Panu, you can ask your question. Hi, um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Interesting conversation. Um, 
uh, topic. Um, I, I mean, of course, we've been uh, looking at the role of youth in uh, saving the environment and the uh, role that the youth um, are trying to play in protecting the environment. So my question is, um, as far as um, uh, to the panel, how can higher education play a role in um, protecting the environment uh, and to educate the, the youth of today? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Banu, for the question. Uh, anybody want to take from the panel? How can we involve the youth? What is the role of, of uh, institution of higher learning to push the agenda of uh, uh, green? And how, what, how can we, are we doing good or do we need to do better? Um, uh, I can share something. Um, there's yes, this uh, higher ranking, um, higher uh, ratings, ratings and ranking for universities in the world. And there's one by THE meant for the most sustainable universities in the world. And from what I gather from the top 10 of the, the, the most sustainable ones are that they have curriculums which embed all this, you know, and therefore it, it dynamically um, um, affects the behaviors of the students, not only during their studies, but beyond. It becomes it becomes a habit, whatever that uh, they learn during university, together with with uh, you know whatever specialty that they 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 take during universities. Um, everything is linked to sustainability, and that they have done well. Um, and I'm happy if you don't know. I'm happy to share that one of the top ten of the most sustainable universities, based on last year's ranking, is actually USM. Um, USM is ranked as number four together with a uh, university in Middle East. And what USM has done well is that it has um, a lot of collaborations, perhaps with um, private sectors or the government agencies in terms of getting everyone's participation uh, when, they, when they design their curriculum. So, so that is one way that we can, you know, develop our youth um, and have them have the right mindset um, for all these uh, practices to actually happen uh, in their in their lives beyond universities. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Davy. Uh, maybe I could share something. Um, very much agree with uh, Professor Davy. Uh, we need more youths to really get themselves in touch with this kind of activities. But uh, on the industry sector, probably the universities uh, or the youths could engage themselves with uh, uh, factories who are, probably have uh, reached certain levels, say, example, the multinational corporations, where they can work together with them to see how they are uh, pushing their initiative forward towards the ESG. And uh, with that, they can collect data for their own universities, for their own in-house developments and studies. And uh, it could be replicated uh, back to the local industry. Uh, that's the only thing that I know of at this point of time. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So in fact, uh, it's not just the youth. Uh, if you ask me, uh, you have to go very much lower than that, starting from the school instead. Uh, yeah. Remember, I think Vincent, you, you started off your discussion today with uh, yes, she starts from home. So uh -huh. you actually start from <laughs> at a young kid, even right at the at the, yes. at the kindergarten, three primary school, and all the way. Uh, yeah. I think it is important to impart that at the school level. Uh, we talked in the past about uh, environment club. Then we talk about tourism clubs in schools, and the whole idea was there, and then it just died off, and you moved on to something else. But these were. These were the plans that was put forward by our former leaders to say, hey, you need to instill this at a very young age, not when they become youth, they enter college, then you start talking about environment. It's a bit too late. You have to start very much. Uh, so if you're talking about uh, getting the youth involved, I think it has to be done at a very early age because the kids today, if you see some of the kids, they tend to correct their parents uh, in terms of throwing rubbish outside of the car, and the kids may will actually tell the parents this is wrong to do. And, yeah. and you see that, uh, and uh, you see more and more 
kids are advocating uh, on on the environmentalism you see that happening across the globe everywhere so so i think education had to start uh, at at the that's what i think okay uh let's see uh, if there's uh, any more question uh, in the chat uh like okay uh there's one more here uh my view on educating the public on mother nature should start from home as what mr vincent mentioned educating on the mother nature should be taught from the beginning in kind in kindy too yes correct exactly through the school life to all children yes this is from krishnan yes exactly what I, I, i've been saying i think we have to start at the very uh, early age uh, in order for us to make it through uh, because yeah. remember all of us maybe may not be around in the in the next 20 30 years and the generation who is here today is going to experience the whole uh, impact of environment impact of climate change so uh, so we owe to them to ensure that the decision we make today is going to help uh, the future generation um okay so i know the time is sharp 4 30 so i would like to uh, maybe uh, give an opportunity for one last word from all the panel before we 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 sum up the, the panel discussion today so maybe i start the other way around with mr tony um, your your last words on 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 the topic of discussion today well as uh, Winston say um uh, it start from home but i think the important thing is that there must be consistency in what we practice believe in it and then uh share and build awareness among the community at this moment, we are even having a strong challenge of making sure our beaches are clean. <laughs> so dirty. Uh, so I think uh, there is a lot more for us to do. But at the end of the day, is education, learn and share and be consistent with the practice. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, before I ask uh, the other uh, three panelists, I think one question just came in. Uh, in the chat from Mr. Hari. Uh, he is uh, Mr. Hari teaching in primary school at Sekolah Kebangsaan Sungai Judah Asli in Kerry Island, which is in Klang. Is there any programs that can be carried out in any primary school? I think with regards to, I suppose, two things here that we have in discussion today. One is on environment. The other one is on the gender inequality thing uh, that we've discussed today. Uh, is there anything that uh, is done? Because I, uh, Edwin, I know you you do work uh, with as well. Is there uh, a programs that is carried out in in primary schools, uh, at international schools, uh, in terms of promoting uh, uh, environment? Um, yes, actually, actually, I just post, uh, was just about to say. Actually, there is one organization, international organization called Eco School. Okay, if you go to the internet, you Google Eco School. Uh, actually, then you can see. Actually, this is an organization that um that's from and and encourage school to participate, to become members. And there, if you go there, actually you can see a lot of initiatives the school can can okay. do. Okay, uh, some school that I worked with previously actually uh they were they're also a member of this Eco School, and like GBI and whatnot, they also have certain level you can come in as. I forgot the exact the, the status, but tier one, tier two, and you can go to all the way up to I think in a, a true green school. Okay, I think if you go there, uh, Mr. Harris, uh, you should be able to find a lot of information. Okay, activities that that a school uh can do to 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 become green and sustainable. And 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 this activity actually in the website is actually not only exclusive for big school, you know, school with a lot of children, uh, school with big budget. Some are initiative that actually doesn't cost much money, okay, but are very meaningful and very educational one. So I would encourage you to go into the website ecoschool.global, okay, and 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 uh do a thorough study on 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 the website. Yep, thank you, thank you so much, Edwin, uh, for that. Um, so your last your last word uh on on the discussion today. Uh, my last word is I think for property development, okay, in terms of when we talk about sustainable development and or not, whatnot, um, 
to build a green building, yes, it costs money, but it's easy in a way. Okay, you get consultants, you get people to design for you, then you just build according to plan. Okay, but like what uh, um, Tony mentioned earlier, is the sustainable of the of the practices okay you can have a green building but if you don't have green practices okay it has no use okay so to me is to us is yes we have a green building but the occupants of the building has to be educated to to adopt to to embrace the green um, um, um elements the green practices in 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 uh you know for the green building no point you have very green building but then everybody start bringing disposable plastic to the company and throw everywhere, okay? So therefore, um, this is what we practice as well, okay, in our, 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 our humble little building in Nepal, okay? We encourage, like I mentioned earlier, recycle of material, old furniture being repurposed, refurbished and reused, okay? Uh, don't spend uh, on the new stuff unnecessarily. So I guess, yes, green building is one thing, but the user has to have the green mindset as well. And this again through has to be through education and since since they are small and from the home. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edwin and Vincent. Yes, uh, as uh, for closing, uh, as a manufacturer, we are always finding ways and means to cut costs. When we say when we cut costs, it's also helping us to cut uh, what you call a carbon footprint in our sector. And uh, nevertheless, it's always challenging uh, every day uh, to see the waste is being just uh, on the floor here and even in the uh, equipments, uh, which we see every day. But we are educating the, uh, the, 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 the working class community towards uh, uh, making everything green. But uh, it is tough. As a result, what we are doing is that we are investing more on softwares in high-end equipments to reduce that waste. So in a way, it is also affecting uh, what they call uh, uh, employment, you know. But uh, we are going ahead on that directions and uh, hopefully that uh, we see uh, new uh, youths coming in with all the ECG and green mind. It will help the business community, especially the manufacturing sector in Penang, uh, will help them to grow further, more greener. So we look forward uh, that, uh, like what someone asked, how do we, uh, I think Banu asked uh, on the, uh, what do you call the education sector. Uh, it starts from the school or from Tadika. We need to start somewhere. Uh, but probably uh, if I may suggest, uh, Prof, that uh, maybe Penang should take the lead and probably this state should take the lead to talk to the Penang Green Council in Penang to start some kind of an initiative, you know, by uh, sister uh, together with uh, WOU, or probably if you need the industry support, we could come in and uh, get some things moving. Yep. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Vincent. We will certainly do that. And finally, but not least, uh, Davy. Okay. Um, final words: Save water, love trees. But at the same oh. time, water everybody because everybody needs to grow and everybody wants to grow so that we all will be able to contribute in our different ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, wonderful. Bro. <laughs> thank wonderful. you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Davy, And thank you to all our four panelists today that have tackled the, the, the question of uh, investing on planet. Uh, you, bring, you have brought your industry experience and shared your own practice and your own view of what is happening. Uh, and all of us have uh, learned a lot. We have a lot of students as well in this group today and hope they have also benefited uh, uh, from the session. Uh, the session has also been uh, linked up uh, through uh, the International Environmental Organization. So it is, uh, the, the recording will also go uh, across after this. Wow. And uh, I would like to really thank all of you for the discussion today. Uh, we will uh, continuously do uh, uh, engage closely with the industry to see how uh, the college, district college, uh, will work closely with the, the industry partners to ensure that we are fulfilling the the the, the need of, of the world where we are heading towards uh, being more green. We have seen the impact over the last many years and uh, the thing that's happening even in Penang now, you see the, the haze situation that's happening is all uh, man-made. Uh, and it's something that we need to tackle. So, uh, so once again, thank you for taking your uh, 
the eve of uh, uh, holidays for some of you, many of us, uh, we're shutting down on Friday. So I know it's going to be a long weekend. So stay safe. Uh, think of the environment wherever you are and have a good uh, celebration over the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to okay. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Sama Hari Raya. Yeah. Sama Hari Raya. Sama Hari Raya to everyone. Okay, Devi and Edwin, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.